So the next talk uh, will be by Francisco Escudero Gutierrez, and it will be on learning low degree quantum objects. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So this is a work jointly done with Esri Nivasan and Salam and Arco Paldut, who are there sitting in the audience somewhere, and Carlos Palazuelos. So I will start by introducing a classical version of the problem, the problem of low degree learning. So this dates back to the work of Liam Masur and Nisa, who gave an algorithm to learn function you find on bits that take bounded values and have degree D. And they saw that with n to the power D uniform samples, you can learn these functions. So let me be a bit more precise with this notation. So having degree D means that when you look at the function as a multilinear polynomial, when you look at its full expansion, this expansion is truncated to those monomials of degree at most D. So it's the natural notion of being low degree. And random samples means that X f of x is picked in a way such that x is picked uniformly at random from the Boolean cube. So this is the model they studied, and they proved that with only n to the power d uniform samples, you can learn these functions. And this is interesting because of two things. The first one is that with this structure of being low degree, you can beat by far uh, the learning algorithm that you would use if you had no structure, because this learning algorithm would require 2 to the power, uh, 2, to, 2 to the n random samples, and they also gave a first application of this low degree learning to the problem of learning AC0 circuits, which is a family of constant depth circuits. Since then, there is many works using these ideas of Lina Mansur, but it took a lot of time, 30 years, to improve the algorithm itself. So there were many applications of these ideas, but there is were no really there were no improvement on the algorithm. And this was done by Eskenazi and Abenesvili two years ago and so that with only lock and samples, you can learn these functions. And the reason that we took so long to improve this is because we were missing a tool and this tool came from another field, which is functional analysis, and the tool is Bonemus and Hill inequalities. So since then, many people have tried to extend these ideas of low degree learning using Bonemus and inequalities to other uh, places. And in particular, several authors have tried to prove new Bonemus and inequalities and say something about learning quantum objects. Uh, for example, you can go to the talk uh, of Joe that gave just before, and he explained how you can use bonemus scaling inequality to learn low degree observables. There is also works by Juan Chen and Preskill, and the other works are by the group of Joe, uh, uh, Keller, Slote, Volver, and Sang, and this all focus on learning observables. But what we did was extending these ideas of Bonemus scaling inequality to do low degree learning to other quantum objects. And to do that, we had to prove new Bonemus scaling inequalities. So let me highlight two of our results. The first one is that we proved a Bonemus scaling inequality for quantum channels, which allow us to learn low degree channels. And we also proved a Bonemus and Hill inequality for completely bounded polynomials. And because of the link of completely bounded polynomials with quantum query algorithms, this can be used to learn quantum query algorithms. This is going to be explained more in detail in the next slides. But let me say before that, that we also have more results that I don't have time to talk about. I will just mention that we can also learn efficiently other low degree objects, such as unitaries, Pauli channel, states, bounded functions encoded in unitaries, or Boolean functions. So now let me uh, focus on the result of channels. And let me tell you what is a low degree channel. Let me tell you a bit about physics. So. We are going to consider end-to-end -end qubit channels, and we are going to look at them through the lenses of the power expansion. So uh, you can uh, decompose a channel as a linear combination of these maps P dot Q, where P and Q are tensor product of Paulis, and this expansion is known as the power expansion, and this is somehow the generalization to channels of the Fourier expansion of functions. So given that we have this expansion, we can naturally define degree, and we define degree in the analog way to the one that we used to talk about bounded uh, degree uh, classical functions. And is that we say that this channel is, has degree at most D if this expansion can be truncated to those pairs P and Q such that P and Q act non trivially on at most D places. So they are identity almost everywhere, but on at most D places. And this is also very natural from a physical physical point of view, because this means that your channel can be decomposed as a linear combination of local things of 
terms that only act on a few qubits uh, on its time. So this can be also called being the local. So this is the object that we want to learn. And now let me tell you a bit of computer science. Let me introduce you what is our learning model. So in the learning model that we have is a query access model where we are able to choose an initial state on n plus n qubits, so an extra register, and we are going to apply the channel tensor identity, and then we are going to measure. So this is what we call making a query, and this is our unit of computational effort. So something important in this query access model is that with only one query, you can prepare the, the matrix defined by the coefficients of the public channel. So something important is that this matrix uh, is very nice because it's a state, meaning that it has this one and it's positive semi-definite. And um, something even better is that you can prepare this matrix with only one query. This was proved by Bao and Zhao, and the proof is very simple. So let me depict it. So let's say that these are the qubits where we connect with the channel. So what we are going to choose as our initial state is just the state that you get when you duplicate the number of qubits and you entangle every of the original qubits with one of the new ones with an APR pair. Now we apply the query, we apply the channel tensor identity and we get to the choice state. And once we are in the choice state, we just have to change the basis. We just have to apply a unitary that is independent of the state and we will get to the uh, state defined by the public coefficients. So now when we are here with only one query, what we can do is measure in the computational basis and thus we will be able to sample from the diagonal of this matrix with only one query. So the diagonal of this matrix defines a distribution that we can sample once using only one query. That is going to be important for us. And essentially that is the way that we access the information about the uh, channel. So this is our model of accessing of access to the channel, but we also have to define what is being a good approximation of the channel. So to do that, what we are going to consider is a two distance. So we are going to consider the distance between two channels as the uh, Frobenius, normalized Frobenius uh, distance between the corresponding Choi Hamilkowski representations of the channel. And maybe this is already giving you some information about this being an average case distance. And if you have worked in physics, this of course have a meaning for you, but for the rest of this talk, what we are going to use is not this uh, definition, but an equivalent one given in terms of the public coefficients. So what is going to be important for us is that we have this equality, which is somehow a partial verbal identity for uh, quantum channels that tell us that this two norm can be expressed as the two norm of the coefficients. So if we can learn the coefficients, we will be able to learn the channel. So the complexity measure that we are going to take into account and the task is going to be the number of queries to the channel that we need to learn it up to epsilon error in this distance. So this is our setup. This is uh, what we want to do. And to do that, we need the one of the inequalities, which is a bit of math. So now let me introduce it to you. So what we prove is a non-commutative one of inequality that says that for an n qubit degree d channel, what we have is that the sum of the powers 2d over d plus 1 is at most a constant to the power d. And let me briefly explain why this is interesting from a mathematical point of view. This is for two reasons. So here we have 2d over d plus 1, which is smaller than 2. Just a bit smaller, but it's smaller than 2, and that is very important. And here we have something that does not depend on it. So why uh, is important for this to be smaller than 2? Well, if it was 2 by a parsable identity argument, then this could be, this sum could be upper-bounded by 1. And if you had that data per bound uh, for the sum of the squares of the Pauli coefficients, then you can translate it to an upper bound to, of this sum by using Holden inequality, but that upper bound would depend on n. So the interesting part here is that this does not depend on n, and here you have a power that is smaller than two. That is interesting from a mathematical point of view. Similar results has been applied in many places in pure math. And now what we are going to do is to show, to try to explain why this is also important for an RNN uh, algorithm. So this is important because this is going to mean that the two error that we would make when we neglect all the small Pauli coefficients 
is going to be small. Let me explain why. So let me consider the sum of the squares of the public coefficients that are smaller, smaller than a value epsilon prime that we are going to fix a bit later uh, according to our epsilon and our d that we introduced before. So the thing that we are going to do to upper this, to control this contribution of the small public coefficients is to take these two and divide it in two parts, in 2d over 2 over d plus 1 and 2d over d plus 1. So now this is clear why we wanted here something that was smaller than 2 in the exponent. Otherwise, we would not be able to do this step. And given that we separate this in two parts, we are going to take the part corresponding to this uh, term, and we are going to say that it's upper by epsilon prime, so we just can get it out. And the rest is something that we can control. We can go to the volumeless inequality that we have introduced and say that this is at most a constant to the power d. So we have this, and now what can we do? We can define a notion of being a small uh, threshold that only depends on uh, d and epsilon and ensure that this is small. So what I mean is that by choosing epsilon prime like this, then we would upper bound this, uh, all this sum by epsilon. So this means that the small public coefficients contribute in a small way, and here, it's important that this epsilon prime does not depend on n. And that is going to be the key of why our algorithm is not going to have a complexity that is independent on n. So this gives us a recipe. So first of all, if we can detect which are the big public coefficients, meaning bigger than epsilon prime, and then we can learn them, we would be able to learn the channel because the rest of the coefficients are neglectable thanks to this argument. And given that what we mean by big is something that is independent on n, we are going to be able to find those big Pauli coefficients just by sampling from the Pauli coefficients, which is something that we can do with one query. And we are going to be able to do that just a few times, a time, a number of times independent on n, because what we mean by big does not depend on n. And then we just have to learn individually every of those coefficients, which are going to be not too many. And uh, then we would have a good uh, hypothesis to say that our channel looks like that. So that is how our algorithm works. It, our algorithm works in two steps. The first one is detect the big Pauli coefficients, which we can do just by sampling from the diagonal of the Pauli coefficients. And whatever we have sampled in a few samples, we will say that are the big coefficients. And you may say, okay, now you're only looking at the diagonal, but what happens with the big uh, coefficients that are not in the diagonal. Well, that is not a problem because if a non-diagonal coefficient uh, is big, then given that you are in a positive semi-definite matrix, the two corresponding uh, diagonal coefficients are going to be big. So in this process, we will have found with a few samples all the big coefficients. And again, I want to say that these few samples mean that a quantity that is independent on n because what we mean by big is not dependent on n. And now, in the step two, we just learn every of these coefficients. And we can do that in a very simple way using a swap test. Maybe this is something that I don't have time to explain, but maybe some of you know that Montanaro and Osborne in the paper of quantum Boolean functions, they propose an algorithm to learn the public coefficients of unitaries. You can do very, something very similar for channels and it's based on a swap test as the uh, routine that Montrano and Osborne propose for unitaries. So now that we have detected the big public coefficients and we have learned them, we just have to say that our hypothesis is going to be the one given by setting all the public, uh, big public coefficients to whatever we have learned in the step two and the rest that have not been detected as big and thus are small to zero and everything is going to work thanks to the fact that one of those inequality allow us to neglect these small power coefficients. And the complexity that you get is something that does not depend on n, is 2 to the d square. And this beats uh, by far the general lower bound that you would have if you didn't have any promise on the structure of the channel, which is 4 to the n. So this is all I wanted to say about quantum channels. Let me briefly explain you how can we use one of those inequality to learn quantum query algorithms. So, there was a result about this implicit in the literature, putting together a few uh, famous results. It was not explicit, so I'm going to explain it now. So 
let me be more precise about what Eskenazi Sinaibin is really showed for the forms. So for the forms, they show that with these many uniform samples, you can learn them. And here, what I mean by a deform is a polynomial where you can divide the variables in D blocks and the polynomial is uh, linear on every of the, these blocks. Uh, so for these kind of uh, forms, in particular, the result is more general, but in particular, they saw that they can be learned with these many samples. And this log n looks very good. D squared is not so bad. And now we have to control this. And one uh, may wonder, can we? Yes, we can do it for free because of the classical one and screen inequality for the forms, which says that if we are bounded on the infinity norm, meaning that we take bounded values when we're evaluated on these uh, scalar uh, strings, then the, this norm, which is the d, uh, 2d over d plus one norm of the coefficients can be bounded by a constant that does not depend on it and depends only polynomial polynomially on D. So this is what we have, and this already implies that you can learn bounded forms with uh, a number of queries that is not too, no, a number of samples, sorry, that is not too big. And this also links to quantum query algorithm because Bills, Bullman, Click, Mosk, and the Wolf more than 20 years ago showed what is known as the polynomial method and says that if you have a quantum query algorithm that in every stage, uh, in every query, queries, a different block of variables, then the amplitudes are going to be described by these kind of forms. So putting everything together, you get this result that with poly D to the power D locking samples, you can learn these kind of quantum query algorithms. Now the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. What we're going to use is that the result of the polynomial method can be more strong, can be stronger. You can have more structure if you know that you come from a quantum query algorithm. And then we are going to use that extra structure to improve the bottom blue scale inequality. So this is a structure is that quantum query algorithms amplitudes are not only bounded, but I, they are completely bounded. What do we mean by this? So what we mean by this is that Anura Chalambieta and Palazuelos so that if you have a decoded quantum algorithm, the corresponding form is not only bounded when you evaluate it on minus one and ones, but also when you evaluate it on matrices that generalize the minus one and ones on orthogonal matrices of any dimension. So you pick your form, you evaluate it on orthogonal matrices, and if you take the operator non, that operator non is going to be at most one. So this is somehow saying that you are not only bounded when you are input one dimensional objects, but when you are input any dimensional objects. And of course, this is stronger than saying that you are just bounded on the infinity norm, and maybe you can use this to improve the volume of the constant. And indeed you can. What we can, uh, we would, what we could show is that under this promise of the form being completely bounded, the 2d over d plus one norm of the coefficients is at most one, which is the best that you can get. So just putting these two things together alongside with the result of Skinasis and Ivan Isvili, what you get is that with only d squared locking samples, you can then uh, the quantum query algorithms that we introduced before, which is better than the poly D to the power D lock and samples. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for the attention. A lot of time for questions. Does anyone have one? Oh, yeah. Um, in the last talk for the BH inequality to apply, there was a constraint on the norm. But I didn't see any of that in the first part of your talk. So is there any difference or is it implicitly assumed? Can you repeat the question? For the BH inequality to, 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 to be valid, in the last talk, there was a constraint which says that uh, the norm has to be bounded. Do uh, you agree with that? Or? Oh, you, you mean that in the, for example, in the channel case, I didn't say that the norm was bounded. Yeah. Yeah, but that is because for free, when you have a quantum channel, you are bounded in the infinity to one norm. Okay. Because you are trace preserving. Okay, so, okay. so it's somehow for free. Okay. But in fact, our one of the inequality for channel is not a one of the inequality for channel, it's a one of the inequality for super operators that are bounded in a certain norm. Okay, I see. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, over there. I think it comes from behind. Uh, hi, I was wondering if, 
uh, like you, the channels that you consider, it seems like they have to be like n qubit to n qubit channels. Um, do you also, yeah, can this also be generalized to if you have the number of outputs in your channel is not the same as inputs? Yeah, I think that the same argument that we use for the proof would apply. And okay. in fact, it's the same argument as Joe explained, like, but it's a bit more generalized. Okay, just because you're like the poly decomposition you use is like, um, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, it's like the Krauss operators, sort of. Yeah. Um, but they're square, like the poly, poly operators are square, so. Poly operators, I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I think just like the, your, how you wrote your like poly decomposition, it's, it seems to only hold if the channel is like n qubits to n qubits. Uh, yeah, maybe, but yeah, I, I don't see why this could not be applied for n to n. Maybe you have to tweak it a bit, and maybe you have to work with a different way of considering the Pauli decomposition. But like, I guess another way that people look at it is with this, like the Pauli decomposition just of the Choi state itself. Okay. Um, is there a reason you didn't do that? Uh, yeah, I don't know, like we consider the Pauli decomposition that was introduced recently by Bao and Zhao. And so how this is the one that has the nice properties that has, behaves like the Fourier decomposition for one the functions. I don't know if other Pauli decompositions also have these properties. Thank you. So I have a lot of time. Anyone else has questions? Very good. First uh, step behind you. Um, how about if you don't have access to, let's say, if you if you don't have access to auxiliary systems, do you think similar results could hold? Uh, so I think that probably you can do something. So I think. I would have to think, but I think that, for example, the Fourier sampling, the Pauli sampling part can be replaced by paying a factor n. But yeah, it's a bit technical, but I don't know if the swap test can be replaced, meaning that I don't know if you can learn the Pauli coefficients efficiently. I guess so, but I don't know. So if you set t equals n, you don't recover the naive uh, bound. So no, no. do you think that d square can be equal to d? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So we don't know much about the lower bounds. The best lower bound that you, we get is the one that you have suggested, just saying, if you uh, consider uh, n equal to d, then uh, you get a lower bound for to the d. I don't know if it, you can improve the exponent to d instead of d squared. It's a good question. But usually, these are hard. And I think that in the classical case, in the problem that was analyzed by Eskenazi and Ivan Isbidi, we also have a big gap. Oh, very good. I, I, yeah, thanks. Um, I was trying to think of like natural examples of low degree unitaries and channels. Like all I could think of was uh, uh, like juntas. Are there? Do you have other like natural families of say low degree unitaries? So yeah. So this is a bit of an issue, but I think that a good example is if you consider a Hamiltonian that is local, uh -huh. you can see in shorter short time evolution you take the Taylor expansion, and that is going to be low degree approximately. Uh -huh. Not exactly, but approximately. And that is maybe a setting where this kind of objects can arise naturally. And I also can imagine that, I don't know, having a non 2 interacting channel can make sense in mm -hmm. a lab, which is being the local, I would say. Yeah, thanks. Any final short question? Doesn't look like it. So let's thank the speaker again. And then let's